We're going to look at understanding what mediated communication is. We're going to look at mass communication versus mass media. We're going to look at computer mediated communication. Remember, CMC is computer mediated communication and social media and social media use across contexts. And also the most important thing for you personally is protecting and presenting yourself on social media. So understanding mediated communication. This refers to messages that are not transmitted directly from person to person, i.e. face to face, but through some other communication tool, such as your phone, print, electronics, or anything that is digital, which we call digital communication devices. Just remember, media communication could even be those billboards on the freeway that you see those digital signs. Why should you even study mediated communication? Well, first of all, you need to understand how mediated messages influence behavior and shapes our culture. And this is a really big thing right now. It'll help you analyze the impact of mediated communication in your own life, and it can help you improve your own mediated interactions. In other words, how you're using that. Comparing the forms of mediated communication, we have mass communication and the communication model. It has sources and senders, which involve mass communication sources that are the television, a newspaper reporter, an author uh, from a book, from a magazine, an announcer on the radio, and a studio production team, which, well, nowadays, quite frankly, it's YouTube, because there's a lot of people with a whole lot of YouTube channels out there. The messages or the channels are common channels for transmitting mass communication messages, including over cable, over satellite, through printing presses, computers, and the internet, of course, because the internet is our biggest transmission of messages these days. The receivers of mass communication are large groups and are the intended recipients of the messages disseminated by anybody, the source, who's sending these things out through those channels. Feedback for mass communication and the communication model deals with modern tech that provides feedback channels for us to respond back to the source. Take, for example, much of reality television, and we can go for this much. If you go on to Fox News, CNN, some of the big news stations like that, you can actually add comments once you sign in into a news story, whether they're legitimate or not, just adds to the fake story. They're kind of fun to read sometimes. You get some pretty, I'll use the word heinous opinions in there, but be careful what you read and what you believe. Um, blogs and websites also readers can leave comments generally if we go to a website and buy something within 24 to 48 hours you're getting a survey response hey how do we do or a lot of times it's while you're on the website that it does it cmc and the communication mode there's sources and senders the remember what cmc stand for computer mediated communications these sources include emails social media instant messaging and texts. A lot of times we get Skype spam nowadays. So be careful. If you don't know somebody, number doesn't come up, don't answer it. Don't take a chance. It's a phishing thing because as soon as you say, hi, how you doing? Or hey, what's up? They can steal your voice and do bad things. So be careful about answering people you don't know through these devices. The messages or the channels are common channels for transmitting mass communication. And again, these include cell phones, computers, and the internet. Now, computers, again, that's tablets, iPads, pretty, uh, our wristwatches now, the Apple watches and smartwatches too. Receivers, the people who get the CMC, can be individuals that receive instant messages, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, something like that. Or large groups is when you post a message to a Facebook group or again, Pinterest or Snapchat or Instagram or any of the other new apps out there. Feedback is possible to a social media post. It also includes silence from an online community. No response. We want those thumbs up for Facebook, right? Instagram likes for your post and online commentary that either reinforces or changes how you think about what you posted. How many times have you posted something and go, oh, that's probably not an appropriate thing to do. I reposted something on Facebook the other day I thought was hilarious, but it wasn't on the page that I wanted. I wanted on my personal page, not my business page. So I had to go delete the business post and keep the share on my personal post. Mass communication and mass media. 
Why do we even use media? Well, for informational needs. This is how we gather information. We can use it for entertainment needs. We can use it for relaxation needs. Co-viewing experience when we're watching Netflix with other people, or if you're going to Amazon Prime with family members, or maybe you've got kids, you're babysitting. Um, you could turn these kid-friendly shows on and watch it with them. We can also use media for escape needs, social interaction needs, habit and addiction fulfillment. Some people don't think of internet use as a habit or an addiction, but think about your own personal use of the internet, of what you're looking at, when you look at it, of what time of day it is. Are you consistent recreating animals, I call it, every single day, it's the same thing, same time, you wake up, you do this, you do that. If you are, is it a habit and an addiction or is it just a pattern of behavior? And can you even change it? We can also use media for companionship needs, Skype. We can use it for, there's dating sites, there's all kinds of different sites that you go to for special interest groups. So we use media for a whole many different array of things. So which of the needs of media do you frequently characterize that you use or what's your media consumption like? The effects of mass media, it impacts our behavior and it impacts our culture. Let's break these down individually. Effects of mass media affect our behavior because it can desensitize the audience to violence. It can also lead to negative body image and dieting. Just think about growing up. You see a picture, you see a movie. Did you go out and reenact that as, and we'll go as a child, a single digit age child. Do you remember reenacting this scene? How about even as a young teenager, middle teenager, as an adult? This is scary facts. Now remember, this is from 2013, 2014. By the time a child gets through high school, he or she has seen nearly 200,000 violent acts and 16,000 murders. We're going to exclude war movies, okay? This is a lot of violence the kids are seeing. This normalizes it and it desensitizes kids to this. The research that's been done on this consistently demonstrates a relationship between the consumption of mass media and media violence and aggressive or violent behavior. If you've ever seen two children fighting, is it because they don't like each other or they're just reenacting a scene from a show they saw? There's some pretty aggressive shows out there that we may think, oh, it's not that bad. Well, think about why you think it's not that bad. It's probably because you've been exposed to these huge numbers. The media project and project the impression that there's one idle and perfect body for women and one for men. Kardashians are breaking out of this. Now that's the wisdom tooth shape. I just saw this on the internet. This is uh, July 1st, I'm recording this. Uh, pretty scary stuff. You know, they're normalizing one thing and then all of a sudden saying, well, that's not realistic over, oh, how long, 50, 60 years it took them to figure that out, that not everybody's body is the same. So now they're changing it. And you know what? It's gonna change again and again and again. And actually, I see this guy's ab. I'm going to go do some crunches. I'll be right back. No, I don't feel like it. Well, <laughs> actually I do that in the morning. But this is unrealistic. Okay, this takes probably a year and a half to two years and a lot of work. Okay, be careful of what you're viewing and how you internalize the images in the message that's being sent. Effects of mass media has what we call gatekeeping functions. Gatekeeping is the process of determining what news information or entertainment will reach a mass audience. In other words, the editors, the producers, the directors, the actors, actresses, all these people that are producing this content are doing it for a reason. Well, I'd like to think it's for money, but it also could be to change social cultures and behavioral cultures. This, uh, who is this, Katie Cork here? I think she was accused of creating two fake stories she bent the information and when people looked at the version of the interview that she did it she totally changed the story and it was pretty sad she got in a lot of stuff with it i mean it was it was a really big thing now it's normal i mean wow it, it just think about the fake news out there and I, I know some people think oh it's fake news that's just you know one site 
it's all sides. It's everybody. Anything that is coming at you electronically, please really consider, is it legitimate stuff? If you see the video and you hear the video, that then you can determine, is it legit? But if they cut the video, so you only see a portion of it, say you see there's a lot of police shootings going on and you see the body cam, just at the moment the cop shoots the person with their hands up in the air or, you know, uh, well, then you see the video and you say, oh, wait a minute, those are two guns in his hand and a knife in his teeth and, you know, hand grenades around his belt. Again, we need to see the whole thing. Now police are actually releasing the entire video in length so you can see what leads up to it. I just saw one yesterday on, it was the last day of June, a 10 minute video, absolutely mind boggling compared to what is being said out there in the social media. It wasn't even close to what was being said. And again, I critiqued and judged it based on what my own eyes and my brain interpreted as to what I was seeing. So again, be careful of what's going on and what's coming at you. The effects of mass media can perform agenda setting functions. This is the process of shaping what topics are considered critical for discussion by you and our society. Uh, Edward Snowden, now there's movies out, but when this happened, wow. I mean, this guy was a hero to some, evil enemy of the empire to others. You know, he's the end of the downfall of modern society. It was unbelievable stuff. Uh, it was just absolutely incredible. So again, be careful what's being thrown at you. You know, if you're, you're a constant watcher of one network without balance, you're going to start to develop bias probably. I have a friend, he watches the opposite of what I watch, and I he accuses me only watching one side, but I actually watch both. And he started to do it, and he goes, you know what, you're right. I was really stuck in a one-sided fight. I said, yeah, you, got, you, you have to be exposed to many things so you can form a proper judgment on this. So again, be careful of what you're watching and what you're thinking about it. The effects of mass media can also whoop, perpetuate stereotypes and challenge norms. This has been happening since TV started. You can go back and watch old reruns of I Love Lucy and the Dick Van Dyke Show, and they perpetuated stereotypes. If you go back and watch those, if you've never watched them before, go look. Male-female roles, very conservative, very 1950s stuff. Um, you could go watch a funny show called Mr. Ed. It was about a horse talking, and they were challenging norms with that. A horse doesn't talk. But this Mr. Ed, he talked and he was really smart and he helped Wilbur. And I mean, it was one of my favorite shows growing up. But now they don't have shows like that anymore because they're not interesting to people. There's not enough violence in them. So be careful with the media's perpetuating stereotypes. When programs cast minority race characters in secondary roles, and it doesn't matter what it is, you can read here with white middle class men and women taking center stage. The other way around works too now. Again, this is five years ago that this was done. This has already changed severely in our society. Around the world, probably not. But again, our society is what matters most to us at this moment. So think about this. The media challenges norms when it exposes viewers to perspectives they would not usually encounter. In other words, small minority gets a lot of attention and all of a sudden we think, oh, that's normal? Well, that's normal based on the perspective of the producers, the directors, the actors, and actresses want you to think. So again, use your best judgment when you watch this and question it. Is this legit stuff? Is this real? Or is it just entertainment? Sometimes entertainment is just entertainment for laughs. But if we take that show and apply it to other people and we stereotype, we could be setting up really bad prejudices and really negative consequences for you and or other people. Mass media effects can cultivate perceptions. Again, that's what I've been saying. It's just what the authors say. Heavy television and media use leads people to perceive reality as consistent with media portrayals. All right, so if this is a show about three guys on a couch, and oh, who knows what this is? This was the old, I believe, the direct TV remote. And oh, look, VCR. <laughs> we know this is dated. Not too, I have VCRs, but they we don't use them anymore a long time ago. But this could be the perception. Three guys have to sit here and this guy has to wear a hat and this guy's got to have earrings and bling and this guy's got to wear the button-down shirt and the t-shirt. You know, three very different individuals. It could be a great show, but they could also be setting us up for a different perspective on perceptions. So what perceptions about acceptable dating practices do you think are cultivated among heavy viewers 
of those reality dating programs like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette. And again, this is 2013, 14. There's even new shows in this. They have the reality island shows. I watched one. I was horrified. I was like, are you kidding me? This is crazy stuff. It's just amazing what's out there. Hey, there's something for everybody out there, but beware of what you're watching. Think critically about mass media. You need to develop what's called media literacy. You may have this. Awesome. But if you don't, talk to other people about their media literacy. This is one thing that changes society, sometimes abruptly, sometimes really slowly. But what media literacy is referring to is the ability to think critically about mediated messages and how they influence. Now, the author uses us. I'm going to say you. How does it influence you? Because it's all about you and me and everybody else out there. But you come first. Because remember, where does communication start with? You. You can increase your media literacy by understanding how mass media messages are created. You need to be recognizing the motives behind what the media is doing. And you need to be understanding that media tries to reflect values and ideologies of the people that are creating it, the people behind it, the money people, the power people. Why are they doing it? When celebrities do something stupid, is it because they did something stupid because they're stupid? Or did they do something stupid to get attention to recreate their careers or just to get that limelight going again? I always look at the Kardashians. It seems like they're never out of the news. Or if they are, it's for maybe a week or two. And all of a sudden, something big happens. And wow, you know, the whole social media thing blows up. Well, I guess if you have 40 million followers, it's easy to do. So again, they mastered it. They got this thing down. But again, what are they selling? What are they telling you about this? Computer media and communication and social media. The types of CMC and social media can be categorized by the degree to which the interactions are synchronous or not. In other words, synchronous is about live time. If you were actually listening to me live, we would be synchronous, but you're listening to me recorded. So it's what's called asynchronous. In other words, I recorded this and you're listening to it three weeks later because now it's week 11. Actually, it's almost four weeks. So our class, when we meet for our class, that's synchronous. Online classes, they're asynchronous. They're not happening at the same time. In the synchronous world, we're talking about face-to-face -face communications. Again, Skype or FaceTime is synchronous. Cell phone conversations that are live are instant messaging or texting and online chat sessions are all happening at the exact same time. They're synchronized together. Asynchronous communication is emails that you send. Maybe you sent an email out yesterday and you're still waiting for a response. There's discussion boards that you can post on. In our class, we have a discussion board, but it's more of your diary. But you will have classes where you post and then you have to wait five days for everybody else to post so you can repost, which I'm well, we won't get into that, but just always post first and then you're set. Online support groups can be asynchronous because it, WebMD, yeah, that's an asynchronous communication. If you ask them a question, it might not be right away. It's not the best example, but they might be able to respond to things. And social media websites. Again, you can post on Facebook. If you're Facebook Live, they can respond back live. I've done Facebook Live and post it. But then it's later when I get back to internet because a lot of times I'll post it and it's already happened maybe an hour earlier. Social media. This is a big deal in our lives. It's always been a big deal for you most likely because it's been around since you've been alive. Will it be there in the future? Don't know. Won't even guess on that. But I'm going to say yes. And actually, as of this date, July 1st, I know China started their greeting of people through social media. Um, you're probably already following it. I'm sure we talked about it in class. If you haven't followed this, it's a one-year experiment in China that I got a feeling is probably going to work for the government, but it may backfire. Uh, there's a lot more people than there are people in the government, but depending how it's done, it's going to have a big impact. So social media includes a variety of websites that allow users, you, to connect and interact with acquaintances, friends, family members, organizations, through colleagues, customers, all around the world through the exchange of user-generated content. In other words, somebody has to put something on there before we can respond to it. Now, I'm not going to go through these social media facts because these are moldy and oldy, but look at some of the numbers on these things. This is 2012 when they looked at YouTube. 
go Google right now how many YouTube users there are. This number's probably a little bit higher. The ages probably have changed, but maybe not. Uh, maybe in 10 years, they'll start to change as populations ebb and flow uh, with ages and all that. 58 million Americans, again, these numbers, they're going to change drastically. Which of the four most popular platforms or type of social media do you use that are on this page? Now, blogs. This is when users engage in personal diary-based journaling with other bloggers. When I ask my class live, do you know, does anybody know what blogging is? And a couple people know, but it's not as popular as it used to be because things have changed. Again, things just keep changing in social media. Now, do you know what a microblog is? Okay, well, if you're reading the screen, Twitter. Now, notice, this is how old this is. Twitter was 140 characters. I think it's 280 now, and I don't think they're going to increase that because then it will turn into a blog. It will get big. Vlogs are, well, let's just call it YouTube. If you're a subscriber of YouTube, I follow many channels on YouTube. I don't check them out daily. I get notifications. Sometimes I look at their updates. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I look for new content, piggybacking off other people's content. It just depends what I'm interested in. I enjoy woodworking. So if I'm looking for a special thing about how to sand to not get the grain going the wrong way, I'll type that in and find some guy or gal's site to do it. Uh, one of the plumbers I follow is actually a woman who's amazing. Uh, she's got great videos. They're a minute and a half, three minutes long, and it's helped me a lot, a lot with plumbing. So again, we use these things for different reasons. I use it for entertainment and education and practical use. Social networking sites, again, Facebook, LinkedIn are two of the biggies. Now, I know Facebook by this time, it's, it's kind of supposedly not being used as much. Instagram should be in here, but in 2013, 14, how big was Instagram compared to Facebook? Important characteristics of social media. Communication scholars describe social media as a boundary crossing media because it, it is a communication channel whose personal and professional use spans communication contexts. There's those different contexts. So social media enables ease of communication. We know this. Pick up your phone right now. You can text somebody and they'll text back. Really simple to do. Social media allows you to share details of your daily life in ways that you might not otherwise do. For example, posting a silly picture of your dog. We post pictures of our puppies because they're just really cute and adorable and other people post their funny pictures and then we watch YouTube and it's all that. That's social media stuff. We share that. That's people with common interests. You also might share more information than you intend to in photos and posts that can be assessed by many people. Think about this. You're at a party. You're with a group of people, doesn't matter where, somebody's taking pictures. You're in the background doing something silly or stupid that you shouldn't be doing and or maybe just acting innocent and somebody in front of you is doing it and you're just walking by and you're tagged and all of a sudden you forget to undo all your tags and you have an employer running through all your social media and they see you at a party. Even though you were leaving because you know it wasn't a safe place to be, they see you there. You got to be careful of social media. Always remember this. There's always a camera on you at all times. Now, probably not. Assume there is and you'll be safe. In social media, we also can track each other through GPS. If you have a significant other, family members, um, you can turn on your GPS finder and track where you're at. You know, if you're somewhere where you shouldn't be, well, it's going to show up. So social media can do this. There was a program called, it was an app called Foursquare. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. People would basically say, hey, this is going on here now. And they would have a flash mob show up. Well, there are certain bad people mentioning what they were and what they were doing and what they were selling illegally. And all the cops would show up. And well, that app disappeared real quick because nobody wanted to use it anymore. It was kind of funny. But we can do this with social media. So how does the ease of you communicating with other people through digital devices impact your experiences with social media with people you know and maybe people you don't know. Give that some thought. Social media obviously accommodates a variety of different devices. You can share news quickly right now. Just share, boom, it's out there. Your whole network of 50 million people has it. I mean, it's so fast. When we hit that send button, that's what we would call, you can't take it back. Right. Once it's out there, I, I don't believe you can 
undo a major post send like that because you know what there's trollers out there who are screenshotting everything i think they get paid to do it or they just are professional trolls and somehow they make money oh maybe it's called blackmail so be careful of what you send pause before you hit enter or send it's just something you have to do i watch so many people get into so much trouble because of this please show tolerance for the show a little bit of patience tell people you know chill just don't send it okay think before you send it because you can't take it back yeah you can delete it but it's out there and somebody will have it okay be careful social media allows access to a range of individuals in other words people you know people you don't know you may accidentally share a message to a broader audience than you intended or the wrong person whoa have you ever sent the wrong text to the wrong person when you're texting to about three or four or five people or maybe you didn't put glasses on or maybe you were tired mom or dad got a message that they weren't supposed to get <laughs> yeah i've gotten one of those as a parent too again <laughs> The ease of sending a message out there is so fast. It can do so much damage. It's, it's irreparable damage that can happen on this. Social media can also provide a rich interaction medium. We don't have to leave the home. We can stay in the AC when it's hot and just have a great time, right? You multitask on your devices and have all kinds of times. You can contribute your thoughts and ideas to the public sphere and see how others respond to and take those ideas further and in unique directions. I like to put thoughtful messages on one of the news channels to see who even likes it. It's not because I want likes. I'm just kind of just field testing it out to see what other people are thinking, uh, to see if they're really engaged or they're just chatting on there just to chat. And most of the times they're just on there to vent. Uh, a lot of people don't respond back. But again, you may do it differently. You may need those thumbs up to make you feel good. Is that what really makes you feel good? Or is it the connection with other people. Again, put down the device and go talk to people. Social media users achieve several interaction goals, including expediting, enhancing, or avoiding face-to-face -face interaction with others. Now, if you're sick, this is a good thing. But if you're just avoiding people because you're afraid of that face-to-face -face communication because, oh yeah, growing up, we're not doing that anymore. When I work in the elementary school substituting, the kids are actually working face-to-face. -face. All of a sudden, I get in the middle schools, they're still doing it, but now they got those Chromebooks and it's starting to go about 50-50. And then when you get to high school, there's little face-to-face. -face. When I watch kids in the hallway, the halls are quiet because everybody's texting each other, even though it's probably their friend right across the hallway. So again, try to put down the device once in a while, break out of the mold and go do something different. The uses and gratifications theory suggests that people use media to satisfy their own needs and desires. The UNG or the uses and gratifications theorists do not see the effects social media use as a positive or negative, but rather as a function of the personality traits and uses of the media by the person, by the individual. So let's look at some of these people that use this. The utilitarian or consequence driven user of social media. There's the unworried user, a person who doesn't give much thought to how they use social media. They just kind of do about whatever they want. There's a planner, which means there's purpose behind social media, that everything posted has a reason or a purpose. On my business website, this is how we operate. We're planners on this and kind of utilitarian. This is consequence-driven user. We respond to things that we need to. The self-centered user or the person who only thinks mainly about their own needs when interacting through social media this is the attention grabbers, what I call the celebrities, because to me, that's what they're doing. They never promote good things. They promote their own opinions and interests. There's the sharing user, a person who is motivated to use social media to connect, to disclose, and share indiscriminately. I post a picture of my puppies. Well, I don't care who gets it. It's a fun thing. Now, I don't want it to go to animal abusers. I can't stop that, but I'd prefer they don't get it. They don't deserve my cute puppies. But it's the same thing. People can just send it out there. Anybody can get it. There's protective users or the individual who is always cautious when using social media. Again, I don't respond to everything on Facebook that I see, even if I think I want to, because it might be taken in the wrong way. My opinion might be too strong or it might be too weak or indecisive or it might not make sense. So again, think which one of these reasons do you use social media? 
And do any of these profiles fit your own motivations for wanting to use social media? You need to be critically evaluating your CMC interactions. The hyper-personal perspective has been particularly useful in evaluating CMC interactions. So the hyper-personal perspective is this. It contends that in certain circumstances of CMC, it can be beneficial and rewarding, perhaps even preferable to face-to-face -face interaction. There's also the ability to control self-presentation. Okay. People can reveal, I can't say I can reveal if I'm a smoker or not. I can say I'm not a smoker. Therefore you shouldn't smoke, but people can say, Hey, I'm a smoker. I'm looking for help. Who knows a good program to help me to quit smoking in under 30 days. Well, that's hyper personal. The ability to control what cues one sends out and are present. In other words, I can decide to send a pic or not. You can send out words. You can send out emojis. You could send out a picture. But you're coding something that's being decoded by others. So is it clear? When I send out a picture, I like to send out text too, unless it's within a text chain. If I'm my daughter likes to send me pictures of her garden, I send her pictures of mine. We don't need texts unless there's a question or a comment of, wow, those are big caterpillars eating the leaves. We should probably do something about that. Again, how are you doing this with people? Now, the more personal you are with somebody, I'm going to guess you send less than a stranger. So if you're sharing information, say with a teacher, you're probably going to give more text, less pictures than with a personal friend. You're going to send more pictures, less text. You can tell me if I'm right or wrong in that in the next class. Hyperpersonal perspective is about the expectation that interaction partners may never actually meet face to face. And this is an upheld thing. If you're talking to anybody in your Facebook chain from overseas, you might never meet them. You might Skype with them on the weekends because it's cool but you're never going to meet them. Now, maybe when you're 60, 70 years old, you take a trip around the world and you go meet them. But this is what's so cool about social media. We can use it for a variety of different personal reasons. In critically evaluating your CMC interactions, keep two things in mind when interacting with others through CMC. The absence of nonverbal cues in CMC can result in misunderstandings. And I believe I already said that. And be careful when discussing sensitive topics or concerns through CMC. Now, a voice to voice lifetime conversation is one thing if it's with a friend. But if you're sending texts out, is that friend getting those texts? Are you sending it through Facebook? Are you trying to blow up somebody's Facebook page because you dislike them or dislike something they said or dislike their friends? Remember, Nonverbal communication helps to convey important relational level meanings that sometimes get very misunderstood through CMC. Now, I can open up my, my arms really wide to show you how big this is. You can't see my arms, but what did you hear different about my voice? I opened up my voice to image it. Now, you can tell me in class, does this work for you? But you can't see what I'm doing. How many fingers am I holding up on my closed hand? Trick question. Got to figure that one out. Sensitive topics usually require a richer medium of interaction. You may say something you may regret more easily. And remember, once it's out there, those trolls are going to get it and use it against you. So please be thoughtful and careful on this. Social media use across contexts. There's quite a few of them. Let's go through these quickly. Social media use across contexts and interpersonal communication. This is staying in touch with family, with friends while you're away at college. Well, you're at the regional academic center, so it doesn't quite count yet. But when you go and maybe move down to Kent, that can be there. Or if you go to another college, that will be there. Checking out a blind date on Facebook, Instagram. Be careful of that. Please be careful of that. This stuff's in the news all the time of people getting abducted and murdered. I'm going to say it like it is because that's the reality. If you don't know them, don't meet them. Go with a wing person, okay? This is also the ability to network through family and friends for future career options. LinkedIn.com is a really good place to start meeting people through interpersonal communication. And on LinkedIn, I will warn you, it's not Facebook. It's very different. Warm up to it slowly. Get used to it before you start throwing things on there. Organizational communication is really good with social media. You can connect to company pages where you frequently shop for updates and coupons. Amazon, 
There's a coupon app I have on my computer. I don't even know the name of it. It pops up every once in a while when there's a competitor that has the same product. It just runs in the background. I don't even know it's there in my Google. Uh, but you can put this stuff on your social media platforms. It happens. If you're interacting with coworkers about work priorities, let's say group work, or how about your classmates in school, you can do that. You can use Google Docs. You can use, well, of course, Word, Excel now can be shared too. Or you can just do it through Facebook or Instachat. And you can have private rooms. That's the best part. It doesn't have to be public. Google Docs is one of the best ways to do this too. And don't forget, as a Kent State student, if you haven't done it, we've talked about this many times already, get the free version of Microsoft Office through Kent State support through the tech department. So do you think about future job prospects as you use social media? Not just getting the job, but how about that future job, that potential employer checking you out on social media? What do you have in your past, present, or future that's going to end up on social media that could be embarrassing or damaging to your reputation or possibility for even getting a job interview? Public relations and crisis communication. This is a huge thing with social media. This is phenomenal when there's weather alerts, except when we get weather alerts, usually it's nowhere near us. But when there is, it's a really good thing to have. So public relations and crisis communication can really help out when we send out messages about, hey, there's a chemical explosion in Twinsburg many, many years ago. We actually, it wasn't even social media. It was just a text from a friend of ours who was sitting at the table whose friend was a sheriff who went to the facility in Twinsburg, it was one of the industrial areas, that one of their uh, hydrochloric acid vats exploded, not a vat, a storage tank outside, and the chemical cloud was spreading. Well, I had to get on my phone to call the people at my stores to say, get everybody out now and tell them there is a chemical explosion in Twinsburg and they need to move in whatever direction it was that people were recommending. It was a pretty scary thing because HCL or hydrochloric can do some damage to us. But there was we didn't have the ability to send out mass texts back then. It was one at a time. So you actually picked up the phone and told people, call other people now. And that's how we did it. But now you can just send out one little button and it goes viral. Pretty simple thing to do. Journalism and news reporting. If you have a cell phone, I'm going to call you a journalist. You can be a reporter just by hitting that record button. It's pretty cool what we can do. Remember, there's always a camera around. Who's on it? Who's watching it? Who's using it? And what's it being used for? If you watch some of the paparazzi, yeah, they still have those giant cameras. But how many times now do you see people following other people around? And we'll go on YouTube to look at this. And all you see are people holding up their cell phones, taking pictures of the person bleeding to death on the side of the road, or two kids fighting and really destroying each other, or a mob, or a riot at Beachwood Mall a couple years ago. That one person was breaking it up, but there were 50 or 60 people taking pictures of it. That was pretty, pretty negative look of where our society is really heading. Not only were they not watching the fight, they were watching their cell phones. I watched that video so many times and it was pretty disgusting that nobody, not even the adults, were helping out break up the fight. Political communication is huge right now. We have in my area in Aurora, we have one of our, I want to call a congressperson, one of our city council people. She does a lot of social media and she does it the right way. She uses newsletters, road updates, anything that's going on in the community. There's no opinions. There's no, hey, elect me stuff. Hey, look what I did. It's all community oriented. But very quickly, she goes for re-election probably in 2020. She might start using it for that. But she's already established a good social media base. So no matter what side she takes, well, it's a local take, she's going to use that social media to continue it because she's already got people trained to watch for her. There are politicians, and I laugh really hard out loud when I see them try to use social media and they never have. They don't get it. If you don't grow up with social media doing it right, <laughs> it gets butchered. Just think of all the social media you've seen out there that you just shake your head and go, are you kidding me? Really? There's, there's some pretty silly stuff out there. If you have a grandparent or an elderly person that just started using Facebook, it's really funny how they don't know how to use it right. And they're always asking, hey, how do I do this? How do I do that? Um, it, it's just funny. And you got to help them too. Health communication is really good. Now, Doctors can't send out 
viral media saying, hey, so-and-so has got the flu and stay away from this person, but they can send out a flu alert that there's flu in the area. In our schools, where you probably went to school, if a kid had lice in grade school, usually a letter went home, or it could be an email these days, that says, lice could or could not have been in your child's classroom. Please take precautions and check. I got one of those when my kids were young. It was a snail mail letter because it was pre social media. Scary stuff. I was on a school board and I wasn't even allowed to find out what classroom one kid had lice in. But yet everybody in the school got the same letter. Now we can do that, but they can't name the kid because of privacy laws, which is a good thing to have. And lastly, global communication. Social media can spread around the world very quickly. Turn on the internet right after watching this video, open up any news channel, open up YouTube, see what the latest, greatest thing is going on. And chances are it's going to be from anywhere on the planet. It could be from out in the boonies. It could be from Antarctica, depending if what your subscriptions are. Social media can spread so fast. When we say it spreads as fast as wildfire, it actually is a lot faster. It's more like lightning and lightning travels at the speed of light. And guess what? The internet, even though you might not think it, travels at the speed of light because of how it's transmitted. It's more of a physical process than a reality because of our 3G, 4G, and coming up 5G. So think about what friends you have that are only social media friends. Are they even here in your area? Do they live near you? Or are they in another county, another state, another region of the country, or another country for that matter? When we go to work somewhere, you might go onto social media and look at that company, look at the surrounding community. One of the best things to do if you think you're going to go to another college other than Kent, you can look at the city where you're going to go and find out where all the cool stuff is or where the best pizza shop is or what's the best coffee house or what are the roads like or what about parking? What about weather? Are there cicadas in the summer? Are there blizzards in the winter? You can find all this stuff out through social media. It's out there in we pretty much all know how to find it. But again, be thoughtful, be cognizant, be aware of what you're looking at, who's putting it out there and for what purpose. So projecting and protecting and presenting yourself on social media. Communicating privacy management theory or CPM suggests that people are social and will always need to both disclose private information as well as protect that information. Identity theft is the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Your identity can be stolen in a heartbeat if somebody really wants it. Back when I was a kid, a long time ago, our driver's license actually had our social security numbers printed on them. And we had to carry a social security card. Wow. How about that? Now you can't even give your social security to somebody. They don't want it. They want your last four. That's it. Well, that's because of identity theft. This, this stuff is out there. The theory of CPM describes how people effectively manage private information they share with others through three sets of rules that can be applied to social media. Okay, so remember, this is face-to-face -face and social media. But again, social media can be much more damaging these days than face-to-face -face because it spreads farther. There's privacy rules and co-ownership rules. This clarifies expectations for how others should treat your disclosure to them. So if you send a picture to somebody you say, please don't share this. What do you think? Are they going to share it? Well, they may not, but now it's on your device and their device and it's out there in say the cloud. What if somebody hacks it? Well, you know what? It's like this. If it's out in the internet, anybody who wants it can get it if they know it's there or looking for things. I think we call those people's trolls, right? Now, if you become important in life to where you're in politics, you're a boss, you're a manager, you have people underneath you, you're the leader of an organization, you can become a target very easily for these trolls. So please be careful of what you share and how you share it. If you're going to put something on a Facebook or YouTube and you don't want it shared, you put a pass lock on it, right? We can do this. And then if it gets out there, well, you can pretty much track down who sent it out there. There's also linkage rules. You need to clarify the rules about who should or should not have access to your social media content. 
So just don't tell my family what we talked about today, okay? You know, this is a private text between you and me. Well, it depends. What if somebody's little brother or sister gets a hold of that text? Because you put that phone down and they happen to know your passcode. And they, oh my God, I gotta send this to my friend. This is really silly. This picture, oh my gosh. Whoops. Again, we can tell people don't share it, but people share things. So be careful what you're doing. The permeability rule is clarifying how much private information you're comfortable with others sharing about specific topics. Let's say you have a health issue, a very personal, challenging issue that you're dealing with. You share that with certain people. You don't share it with other people. You need to be careful about that. It's just like talking out loud. If you don't want people to hear, you need to be private. You need to go into a car, shut the door, shut the windows, turn on the radio, and make sure the cell phones are off. If you're walking down the hallway and talking out loud and just screaming out loud about, oh, this person does this and that and the other thing, 50 people are going to hear it. And you know what? Those 50 people, a small percentage might actually record it because they think it might be fun to put out there. So think about these privacy issues. Protect yourself. Establishing privacy rules with your social network can help prevent privacy breakdowns or privacy turbulence. If you've ever been on a plane, those little bumpy things or those jolts are called turbulence. Now, turbulence is actually good when we're flying because that means there's air under the wings. But when it comes to our privacy, it's not a good thing. So another way to manage your privacy is to re-examine content you've already posted and make deletions. Now, if you've never thought about this, I'm telling you, think about this. Go back and audit yourself. Go back on your Facebook, your MySpace, whatever it is that you have. Go back to the beginning of time that you started it when you were five or six or seven or eight or 14. I don't care how old you were and audit yourself. What is on there? I had a Facebook page that was not significant. It took me weeks to go through it because of the, the years that were involved in it, because it was there and I had to go through everything. And now, you know what? How many times do you open up your Facebook and it says, hey, remember when? Three years ago. And it shows you pictures that you no longer have on your page. I personally don't like that. I'm sure there's a setting, but I just haven't looked for it yet. But what if that gets out to other people? Now, I've been told, and I kind of believe this too, if you delete a post, it's still there. Now, I don't know if Facebook changed the way you delete things, but generally, if you delete a picture, it's still in the internet. It's still there. It's somewhere on some massive server in some gigantic cave where there's trillions and quadrillions and quadrillions of gigabytes and whatever the biggest number you can think of of memory. Everything is there. So remember this. If it's out there, it's out there. But audit what people can see without really picking. All right, so think about this. Social media users most frequently delete content in order to manage conflict. In other words, if you just screamed and yelled at somebody through Facebook and blew up their page, delete it. It can ensure safety needs. I see people say, hey, we're in the Caribbean right now for the next three weeks. Wish you were here. Wow. Everybody that sees that now knows your home is not guarded. Who cares if they have ring and the GoPros and everything in their house? Wave at them in the cameras. You're, all your stuff's stolen. And there's a lot of burglars that do this. It's hysterical. Go on YouTube if you don't believe me. Burglars come in. They wear masks, hoodies. They cover their face. They know everything's on camera. Only the stupid, stupid, stupid ones don't wear anything. And they're probably mentally challenged at that point, too. You can delete content in order to prevent getting sued or ridiculed. I'm not talking about cyberbullying. I'm talking about getting sued. If you put a private picture of somebody that's not supposed to be private, in other words, it was a private thing, you can get sued for that. Yeah, it may be funny, but if they find it not funny, there's a lot of lawyers looking to make money out there. Be careful. Delete content to minimize job-related problems. This is even getting the interview. If you're talking bad stuff about a certain topic and you're going to a job that deals with that topic, you better be careful because your opinion matters. But when certain people see it, their opinion matters more when it comes to giving you a paycheck. People delete content in order to control impressions more carefully. I'm not talking about thumbs up, thumbs down. I'm talking about the perception of how you are perceived with other people. Because let's say you're on the stage getting your high school diploma. That's a good impression. 
Now, the trolls make fun of that. Okay, that's their problem. They obviously didn't graduate or won't graduate. That's a good thing. But if you're taking a selfie of yourself with a cop, getting a speeding ticket and saying, and you're smiling, my first ticket, look, probably not the best impressions you should be putting out there. There's probably some cops that say, hey, you want to do a selfie? <laughs> you know, they do social media too. I, they're probably on YouTube. People delete content in order to regulate emotions. You may put something out there that is sad because something bad happened and you decide in a month you want to delete it. That's a good regulation. Uh, some people do it for self-help. Just depends what you need it for. People delete content to remove any indicators of a sour relationship or bad relationships. If you're in a relationship and you start blowing up each other's Facebook page, well, that's one thing. But sometimes maybe you just don't want people to know because you don't want their input. You just want to deal with it yourself. That's one way we might want to delete content too. So can you think, it says, can you share, but I'm saying, can you think of an example of a time you removed info from your social media sites, plural, for any one of these reasons? Or can you think of any other reasons that you might have deleted information? 